Good afternoon, you're watching the news at one. Your top business stories. Coming in lower than expected, consumer inflation remains flat in August. SAB Miller reaches a deal to buy Australian brewing giant Foster's. And as the IMF cuts its growth forecast for the world economy, it calls on Europe to get its act together. Faith will have your main news headlines in a moment, but first, uh, here's Gunter uh, with some news on the markets. Thank you, Devon. Um, you can see the colour behind me is very green. If we look at the names on the board, Harmony, Barlow, Anglo, Richemont, Goldfields, Investec, etc. These are all Rand Hedge stocks. So, in other words, companies that make their money in foreign currency, mostly dollars. And uh, because the Rand is so weak today, it's trading above 785. We've got a situation where these companies' earnings are likely to be impacted positively, so it looks like uh, investors are looking at that, uh, at least from a local perspective. European markets, on the hand, are doing the opposite. We all know the Greek story, and that's playing itself out again today. Uh, details are following a little bit later on. For now, it's back to studio. Thanks, Gunter. Good afternoon. President Jacob Zuma says government is fully committed to the principles of open governance. Speaking at the launch of the Open Government Partnership in New York, he committed South Africa to promoting transparency, fighting corruption and empowering its citizens. Leaders pledge to be more transparent and to make government activities more open and to develop tools and innovations that empower citizens better. That's the purpose of open government, and I believe that's the essence of democracy. That's the commitment to which we're committing ourselves here today, and I thank all of you for joining us as we meet this challenge together. President Zuma lauded South Africa's progressive constitution and pointed to the country's Chapter 9 institutions that safeguard openness. These institutions are an important armory in promoting and protecting the rights of our citizens. He also punted his country's free media credentials. We pride ourselves on having freedom of expression and media freedom that are enshrined in the Constitution. This makes our vibrant democracy with a healthy exchange of ideas in society also important in promoting open government is the fight against corruption. The President's remarks and government's participation in this partnership will be roundly welcomed by activists who have mounted fierce opposition to government's much touted protection of information bill, which they argue will impede media freedom and lead to greater government secrecy. Shervin Bricepies, SABC News, New York. International relations has clarified what is seen as an about turn by the African Union on supporting a national transitional council in Libya. The AU earlier refused to acknowledge the NTC, insisting its peace roadmap was the only credible solution to the conflict. Deputy Minister for International Relations and Cooperation, Marius Fransman, says the Transitional Council wrote a letter to the AU giving its assurance that it will work towards constitutional democracy. Based on these assurances, the AU is now welcoming the steps the NTC is taking to restore peace in Libya. Initially, it said it would not support it unless it was inclusive. It should be stressed that South Africa through the AU, our committee remains re ready to offer its full support in this respect and to overall efforts to stabilize the situation, promote democracy and re reconstruction. On the issue of Libyan leader Mohammed Gaddafi returning to the country to face the people, Fransman would not be drawn into that or whether Gaddafi would be given refuge in Africa. Abra Barbia, SABC News, Parliament. Typhoon Roke has made landfall near central Japan and is headed for the nation's capital, Tokyo. 
The Category 2 storm pummeled the shores of Wakayama Prefecture with winds of over 160 kilometers per hour and heavy rains. The typhoon has reportedly already left four people dead and caused heavy flooding in the central parts of the country. The Japanese government warned all those in the path of the typhoon to heed any evacuation orders immediately. Over a million residents around the city of Nagoya were advised to evacuate as parts of the city were flooded. Israeli forces clashed with Palestinians in the West Bank city of Hebron. The flare-up in violence comes hours before the opening of the United Nations General Assembly where Palestinians plan to seek United Nations endorsement of their statehood. About a dozen Palestinian teenagers threw stones at Israeli border police in Hebron. Some set fire to tires in the road. Israeli forces fired stun grenades and tear gas to disperse the crowd. The Hebron incident follows clashes between the Israeli army and Palestinian residents near the Jewish settlement of Yitzhar last night. President Abbas plans on Friday to submit an application for full UN membership for the state of Palestine. In Pakistan, at least 26 Shiite pilgrims have been killed after gunmen opened fire on a bus traveling to Iran. Four assailants attacked the bus carrying more than 50 pilgrims. The gunmen opened fire on the bus from all four sides before getting into the bus and firing again. Three more people were killed when gunmen shot at an ambulance as it headed to the attack site. Pakistan has seen a surge in violence since Osama bin Laden was killed by U.S. Special Forces in May. In Afghanistan, the killing of the former Afghan president and head of the government's peace council has sparked protest in the country's economic center, Kabul. Bhutanuddin Rabani was killed by a Taliban suicide bomber yesterday. The attack is believed to have been a strong statement of Taliban opposition to peace talks. It's delivered a heavy blow to hopes of reaching a political end to the war. Today, protesters took to the streets of Kabul to express condemnation for the assassination. The attack came just a week after a deadly 20-hour siege by militants in the fortified capital. To Rugby News, Tonga and Japan played one of the most exciting Rugby World Cup matches to date in the only match of the tournament today. It was a ding-dong battle with Tonga eventually scoring a 31-18 victory. The most entertaining match of Rugby World Cup 2011 was on the cards when Japan, Japan who play an expansive game, took on the hard-hitting and physical Tongans in the third round of matches in Pool A. So it was not long before the opening try came of Yela Mumafu over for Tonga. Japan's tactics were pretty clear. Stretch the Tongans wide and look for the gaps for the ball carrier. Two tries apiece saw the teams go into the break with Tonga leading the Samurai Warriors by just five points at 18-13. The final 40 minutes were just as exciting. Persistence finally paid off when Fetu Vainakolo finished off for the Kingdom of Tonga, who then opened up a 15-point lead. But the team from the land of the rising sun were not out of it yet. This try bringing them to within 10 points. There were to be no more tries in the match, as the Tongans held on to their 31 points to 18 lead and secure their first victory of World Cup 2011. They now climb to third place behind New Zealand and France. Tabi Sositole, SABC News. And finally, it was once one of Hollywood's best kept secrets, but not anymore. The iconic Hollywood sign is drawing in hordes of tourists seeking the Kodak moment. Previously, getting to the unmarked viewing area meant having to navigate through a maze of narrow neighborhood streets that left many lost or back where they started. 
Now, thanks to GPS and the internet, tourists have discovered the small clearing, which offers up a dramatic photo up of the Hollywood sign. But the allure of the iconic symbol has caused a huge shadow on the surroundings. The one-time serene community of Hollywoodland is turning into a tourist trap. It seems for neighboring residents, the much-loved symbol of the Hollywood dream has become a nightmare. And those were your news headlines, your market news coming up after a short break. Welcome back. A look at the global markets now. We start in the U.S. where stocks ended little changed yesterday after giving up earlier gains. Investors were waiting to see if the U.S. Federal Reserve would offer more economic stimulus and if Greece made progress in talks to avoid a default. Another round of protests in the streets of Athens, Greece, as the country braces for another round of austerity measures. The government is promising deeper spending cuts and more job losses are expected for the public sector. Greece is trying to convince international lenders to give it more money before it runs out of cash by next month. But the International Monetary Fund, European Central Bank and European Union don't appear ready to sign on just yet. The so-called Troika will meet again at IMF meetings this weekend. Gary Stern, former president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, says a Greek default is not a matter of if, but when. There might be something to be said for a default or a restructuring or whatever you want to call it uh, sooner rather than later, but of course there are likely to be some consequences for other countries that are currently part of the euro that, that may exacerbate the situation if this is not handled uh, quickly and in an orderly fashion. That's being closely watched by the Federal Reserve. Policymakers are largely expected to announce new measures to get the U.S. economy back on track on Wednesday following a two-day meeting. And another bleak housing report was sure to add more urgency to that discussion. Construction of new homes fell more than expected in August. In corporate news, General Motors and the United Auto Workers have a new contract. The tentative agreement will create more than 6,000 jobs in the U.S., according to the union. This was the first labor deal since a government bailout of GM two years ago. All right, more details in the markets now. Going to Deutsch uh, at the JSC. So uh, it says uh, it's not a matter of if, but when, Gunther. Yeah, indeed, it looks very likely that the Greek government is going to default in the end. The debate about them exiting the euro is also picking up steam, uh, but of course that is likely to remain a moot point. U.S. and Europe uh, both in recession, at least that's what many are saying, and then we see the oil price remaining relatively stable while gold is trading back above $1,800 per ounce. And uh, yeah, for our local mining companies it's absolutely fantastic in rand terms. The price is now well above 450,000 rand per kilogram. At the start of July, we were looking at 320,000 rand. Goes to show why gold mining shares are doing so well at this point. Let's go to the boards and see where things are. The Nikkei was higher by a quarter percent. The Hang Seng was down one percent. Shanghai Composite had gained 2.6 percent. Johannesburg, the oil shares up by half a percent. Industrials have lost a fifth of a percent whilst uh, the financials up 0.7% and banks 0.6%. Resources higher by 0.6%. Gold miners, there you see it, 1.8% higher than yesterday, whilst platinum miners are up 1.5%. In dollars, the gold price is $1,810 per ounce, whereas platinum is trading at 1793 and Brent North Sea crude Slightly higher again at $114.23. 7 Rand 83 is the price of $1. 12 Rand 28 the price of a pound. And 10 Rand 72 to buy you 1 euro. Just goes to show how uh, the Rand is being viewed as a rather risky investment at this time. Today we talked to Gregory Katzenellenbogen and he's from Sunland Private Clients. Welcome, Greg. Hello. Greek default, is it priced in? 
Well, I think largely priced in. I don't think it's 100% priced in, but I would imagine that it may be 80% of it's priced in. If it happens, uh, or possibly when it happens, then um, I think, you know, the markets, there'll be an initial um, sell-off, but I think a lot of it is priced in. So we won't see much of a sell-off? I don't, I think, uh, you know, this sort of default has been telegraphed for some time now. The whole world is expecting it, and I think they just need to get... um, you know, their ducks in a row and things protect the institutions that will be will suffer from a, a Greek default and make sure that the banks are propped up. But uh, I think to a large extent uh, it's what everyone is expecting. The fallout is turning out to be quite good for our gold producers with the gold price so sticky at these very high levels and the weak rand. That uh, begs the question, at what rand price can they become more adventurous with regards to digging deeper? Well, look, that's difficult to say. As you said earlier, you know, 450,000 rand uh, per kilogram um, of uh, gold at the moment. I think, you know, it varies from mine to mine, but work on maybe 250,000 rand a kilogram of costs. So there's, there's a lot of margin for them to play with. But for a long time, you know, the gold price has been going up at gold shares of lag behind because still a big problem for South African gold miners is, of course, their costs. And, you know, things like electricity has, has gone yeah. up quite... Uh, uh, substantially cost of steel has gone up so the costs have been under pressure but now you know if the gold price can hover around these levels and the rand can stay at these levels or even go a bit weaker then they'll probably even have room to be start returning some money to shareholders Rimbro, um they've been quite busy yesterday they bought a piece of Grindrod exposing themselves to the export market and Asia etc Today they sold off Tracker, which happens to be consumer-related. What does that tell you? Well, I think they probably see that maybe the the Tracker business is, is, you know, it's uh, mature now and that, you know, the growth won't be um, as great as it was in the past. Don't forget they were one of the founders of this uh, company back in the 80s, so they've done exceptionally well out of it. But, uh, you know, Tracker operates in many, many countries around the world. But I think they basically, what they're telling you is that they think, you know, they've they've got as much out of it as they can and it's now somebody else's turn. But I think it's... uh, it's safe to say that they feel that the investment is at a mature phase now and the growth won't be as great going forward. Should we follow Rembro and go buy Grindrod shares? Well, look, they've done, you know, they're deploying their, their huge cash pile, so I think they've made a good investment there, moving into infrastructure investment. It's not to say that they won't increase the stake over time. Uh, they have a lock-in on those shares. I think for 18 months they can't sell, but certainly if you want to be in the logistics business and uh, exposed to infrastructure, then Grinrod is, uh, looks a good buy. CPI came in unchanged at 5.3%. Are you relieved? Well, look, a surprise, uh, I would say, because we expected that it would be it would be higher. But if you look at the numbers, it's things like cereals and breads. The, the uh, prices were down slightly. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the increases in things like electricity weren't as great as they were in July. So that certainly helped somewhat. But we do think that, you know, pressures are, will come from food inflation and ultimately that the, uh, ban- the inflation will rise. And then, of course, uh, tomorrow is MPC. These numbers will play a role. But uh, do you think maybe the bank would be better off just sitting back and waiting for a moment before they make a move? I think they will. Um, I don't expect them to um, uh, do anything tomorrow. I think they'll leave rates on hold and uh, if uh, you know I, I would suggest that they do uh, just leave things and see how things pan out we're not sure really where the rand is going to go uh, at the moment uh, we obviously there are things that are out of our control like the oil price but um, you were mentioning earlier about retail figures coming out you know slightly ahead of the previous month so I don't think that they'll be in any rush to uh, cut the interest rates uh, maybe it's not all doom and gloom as we believe thank you for your time Pleasure. There you go. Gregory Katz Nellenbogen from Sunlum Private Clients and saying sit tight. Um, may look bad today, but uh, we don't know how it's going to pan out, so just wait. All right, thanks very much, Gunther. After the break, the NUM appeals the Labour Court ruling on its uh, wage dispute with ESCOM. Stay with us. Does your pool look like this? 
then you need Verimark's new and improved Pool Gobbler Pro. With enhanced float technology, it automatically adjusts to the level of any pool. Pool Gobbler creates a circular flow, and its clever Venturi system acts like a magnet, pulling all floating debris into the filter bag. Stop struggling with that pool net and change to Pool Gobbler Pro. Simply set it and forget it, and it works 24 hours a day so you don't have to. Get your Pool Gobbler Pro with reusable filter bags at your nearest leading store now. The SABC has signed a code of conduct that is enforced by the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. Under the code, we are committed to giving news that is accurate, comment that is fair, and programming that is not harmful to children, does not amount to hate speech or the description of gratuitous violence or explicit sex. If you think we're not living up to that code, then you can inform the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. Direct any complaints in writing to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa, P.O. Box 412-365, Craig Hall 2024. That is P.O. Box 412-365, Craig Hall 2024. Or send a fax to 011-325-5736 or an email to bccsa at nabsa.co.za. For more information, please visit www.bccsa.co.za. SABC, the leading radio and television broadcast of South African content, is inviting you, the public, to get a copy of your favorite local shows. We have picked 10 of the best radio and television shows for you. For a minimum price, be the proud owner of your all-time favorite radio or television show. Call the number scrolling below for more details. This exciting offer is brought to you by the SABC. Welcome back. South Africa's consumer inflation rate remained unchanged last month at 5.3%. The news caught economists by surprise, as most were expecting the figure to increase to 5.6%. Most economists had predicted inflation to rise to 5.6% last month from 5.3% in July, mainly due to rising food prices. But food prices only increased by a negligible 0.3% last month, causing the overall inflation rate to remain flat. The turn of events has caused many economists some blushes. Yeah, we'd better be wrong on the downside than on the upside. You get the point. So, like, it's a, it's a good number, surprisingly good number. Uh, I mean, food inflation uh, was the key driver during the month. Food prices went up by only 0.3%, and that sort of tempered the effect of higher fuel prices during the month. So, it is a pleasing number. The good inflation figure has paved the way for the Reserve Bank to cut interest rates tomorrow to help jumpstart the struggling local economy and stem the tide of massive job losses. The, the debates at the MPC now are all about you know, the outlook for inflation balanced against you know, the growth story. Growth at the moment, uh, prospects are very weak. Uh, you know, the jobs numbers are not very satisfying. I mean, even the economic indicators, I mean, uh, yesterday we saw the leading indicator from the Reserve Bank for the past couple of months has been pointing downwards, you know, at best moving sideways. So that tells you that, you know, like the, our economy has hit a soft patch. When you look on the inflation side, at least we had a piece of good news today. So that tells us that you know like it's more tilting towards the debate is going to tilt more towards you know uh, looking at the growth story than worrying a lot about inflation although we still expect inflation to go up in the coming months because of the weaker end because of rising fuel prices you know they at the moment it gives them room to put through that interest rate cut should the need arise in the next few months we think uh, maybe growth weakening further but like i say you know tomorrow we don't really expect a cut we expect interest rates to remain flat although chances of a cut have improved somewhat so it's no longer a question of whether the reserve bank will cut interest rates but how soon business news Jonas bank and now in news just in stats essay says consumer spending accelerated to 2.8 percent in july from a revised figure of 2.4% in June. Economists say the Reserve Bank is now most likely to keep interest rates unchanged tomorrow. 
the chances of a rate cut at the next MPC meeting in November remain high. Brewing giant SAB Miller has agreed to buy Australia's Foster's Group for an increased price of five Australian dollars ten a share. This values the Australian beer maker at the equivalent of 10.2 billion US dollars. The deal would put SAB Miller at the head of Australia's beer market. The agreement still has to be put to Foster's shareholders. The London-based brewer of Peroni, Miller Light and Grolsch launched its initial cash bid and then went hostile by taking the offer direct to shareholders last month. But Foster's rejected both approaches as being too low. The National Union of Mine Workers has lodged an appeal at the Labour Court following the court's rejection of an application to stop ESCOM from implementing a 7% wage increase. The Labour Court ruled against the NUM on Monday. Now the union returned to court this morning saying it's determined to fight ESCOM to the bitter end through both court and industrial action. The union is calling for a 13% increment and a 3,000 rand housing allowance. ESCOM's last offer on the table was 7%. Former gold miners said to be suffering from lung diseases have approached a British court in a lawsuit against Anglo-American. Lee Day and Company is acting for the more than 450 miners. It says the claim against the largest gold miner in South Africa potentially involves hundreds of millions of pounds. The miners allege they are suffering from silicosis and silicotuberculosis from exposure to dangerous levels of dust on the company's South African gold mines. The latter was brought before the London High Court as Anglo-American SA is under management of the UK headquartered Anglo-American. Under European law, English courts have jurisdiction over a company that, its central administration, that has its central administration there. Now, the South African Local Government Association, SALGA, says it has a funding backlog of more than 70 million rand. It says this is making it impossible for the organization to fulfill its constitutional mandate. SALGA relies on money from the national fiscals and from municipality subscriptions and other sponsors. But the police management says these funding models are unreliable. Membership uh, structure of SALGA... Uh, remains the key source of funds at 68 percent and government grant at 13 percent and uh, other income that is also unreliable is around 19 percent so the 68 percent again um, i would like to emphasize this point is one of the most unreliable stream the organization also wants an increase in municipal grants they argue that municipalities are also unable to meet their obligations due to increasing demands they propose a local business tax, which municipalities will be able to secure from local businesses for their own additional revenue. But earlier, the Deputy Minister of Cooperative Government urged them to instead use their available resources more effectively. They're making a case for more money from the National Fiscus. We're saying, well, use the money you currently have more productively more effectively and your case becomes strengthened. But in all spheres of government, I think we'll all agree, there is a need for us to curtail unnecessary expenditure. Salga is also proposing a review of councillors' remuneration packages. Manilis, Tubasa, SABC News, Parliament. The Discovery Invest Leadership Summit is in full swing at the Santon Convention Center. Already the summit has produced some alarming views. Yesterday, renowned economist Noriel Rubini said the USA is in fact in a recession and that the world is set to follow. Today, we caught up with Maria Ramos, CEO of APSA, to get her views on the matter. Maria Ramos preferred to focus her speech at the summit on the growth stories of Africa and Asia. These regions are expected to make up half of world economic output by 2015. But the situation in America and in Europe certainly poses a threat to growth in these areas. The U.S. faces a, a you know, there's just been another downward revision of, uh, of GDP. We saw the IMF report yesterday uh, warning and alerting everyone to the fact that a, a double dip is now a serious concern and a, a real possibility. So I think we're living through some very challenging and difficult times. 
That, however, is no reason to be complacent. We don't have young people coming out of our education institutions with the right levels of skills, with the right levels of literacy and numeracy. We're just not going to have a competitive economy. In fact, Ramos believes that during this time, we should pour even more investment into enhancing our own country competitiveness. I think right at the top of that list is investment in our human capital. You know, countries that succeed over time succeed because they're investing in people. Our biggest asset on this continent is our people. In fact, it's going to be that population dividend, the, the human capital dividend, that will continue to pay for Africa for many, many decades to come. So investing in education is important. It's going to be important for every single country on this continent. Infrastructure investment should also be ramped up, and although macroeconomic stability is a prerequisite for growth, it is not enough. Collectively, the national work ethic also needs to remain steadfast. There are no silver bullets here. These are long journeys that require commitment, both from governments, from the private sector, from the citizens of our countries and our continent, and it's just that will to stay the course and understand that over time we do achieve greater equity, greater uh, prosperity for the citizens of this continent. Maria Ramos spoke to us at the Discovery Invest Leadership Summit. After the break in our personal finance slot, we take a look at what the recent market volatility means for retirement investment. Details coming up. Welcome back. Analysts have urged people to have a retirement or who have a retirement fund not to panic over market volatility on the JSE. Now, stock markets across the world have been falling since August in reaction to the economic problems in the U.S. and the Eurozone. Most pension funds in South Africa have exposure of about 60% to equities. So the fluctuation and instability being experienced on the financial markets does affect retirement funds. But investors have been urged not to pull out their investments at this stage. Analysts say this is the best time to invest in shares because you are likely to buy them at lower prices. Market timing is a mug's game. No one can time the market. And then, you know, it's all about your strategy. When you're investing, you're investing for a period of time. If you've got a long-term time horizon, anything 6, 10 years, 15, 20 years out, you have to have growth assets. You've either got to be invested in equities or you've got to be invested in property or both. And there are going to be times when markets are down. But those are not bad times to be investing. So if your strategy is correct and you know what you're trying to achieve long term, then you certainly should not be panicking. Those who have only a few years until retirement are advised to reduce their exposure to more risky investments. The money market is just one investment that's been recommended for those who cannot afford to take more risk. But people should still put up a certain portion of their money into equities to beat inflation. I think for somebody approaching retirement, so somebody that's very close to retirement, ideally they would have been reducing their exposure to the stock market over the last few years. You know, because you, you're now in the consolidation phase. You, you've gone through the accumulation phase when, you know, hopefully in your early 30s, late 20s, and through your 40s. Um, and as you, you start approaching retirement, you, you now perhaps become a bit more uh, circumspect with that money. You, you start to look after it a bit more. Um, and growth is less of an objective, and capital protection is more of an objective. Only about 6% of South Africans are likely to retire comfortably, and this is likely to put a burden on the straight, as it will be forced to increase expenditure on state pension. People are living much longer now because of improved medical technology. The challenge is, though, is that people are living longer, um, and as a result, you know, they're going to be in retirement for 20, 30 years. So you can't disinvest too much from equity because uh, you've still got a 20-year horizon for that money. 
Um, and, and over 20-year periods, the stock market is still the best place to be. So it, it, it really is a combination of factors. If people haven't saved enough for, for their retirement, th they may find that they're going to have to take on a bit more risk um, and keep, perhaps keep a bit more invested in the stock market than they would like. Many people do not preserve their pension money when they change jobs, but government is finalizing legislation to force people to do so. Currently, employees with a provident fund can withdraw all their money when they retire. Now, new proposals are underway to ensure that provident fund members do not withdraw their entire pension at once. The biggest problem in South Africa is when people leave companies, they're not forced to preserve what's been saved in their retirement funds. And so many use it. Unfortunately, many of them need to use it. You know, if you get, a, if you get retrenched and the only money you've got in your retirement fund and you've got to feed your family and do the things you need to do, you've got no choice. But again, the new proposal is that preservation will become compulsory. Legislation that would force everyone who's employed to belong to a pension fund is still under discussion. But experts say this is not likely to be feasible because many earn less and do not have much disposable income. This could also put a huge strain on small businesses who have limited resources and cannot afford to set up a retirement fund. Do you set up a pension? Well, international business news coming up after the break. Do stay with us. Something should never slip your mind. Business TV licenses. Pay yours by the end of the month. Don't miss the magnificent repeat of the South Africa versus Namibia game from 11 p.m. on the 27th of September on SABC2. It's our game. My name is Maite Nkwana Mashavani, Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. I'm the incoming president of COP17, COPMOP7. Climate change is the increasing average temperatures and extreme changes in weather patterns that can lead to severe natural disasters. If climate change is not addressed urgently, its impact will change our country, our continent, and indeed the world as we know it. My responsibility is to facilitate credible, inclusive, and fair outcome of the conference. From the 28th November to the 9th of December 2011, please join me in welcoming the world to the city of Durban. Let us build on the successes of the FIFA Soccer World Cup. South Africa is ready. Working together, saving tomorrow today. A message from the South African government. Why is hospital insurance from Clientel Life so popular? Let me make it clear. They offer a standard hospital plan and a premium hospital plan, which pays up to 5,000 Rand per day in hospital. Yep, 5,000 Rand per day. SMS premium to 37128 and they will call you back to explain all the benefits and terms and conditions. SMS now. Clientele life. Clearly. Welcome back. The International Monetary Fund has warned that the global economy has entered what it calls a dangerous new phase. Global recovery is now much weaker than was predicted just months ago. And the IMF has cut its growth forecast for the global economy to 4% for 2011 and 2012. Now, the IMF's chief economist, Olivia Blanca, has also warned that uh, European officials are lagging in addressing their debt crisis. Speaking ahead of the IMF and World Bank meetings this weekend, he said there are additional concerns that Europe and the U.S. could slip back into recession. Differentiating between perhaps the uh, U.S. timeline and... On, on the Eurozone, uh, you're right. <laughs> behind uh, the uh, action in markets. Uh, and uh, I think we are very explicit uh, in our messages, both in the WIO and elsewhere, in saying that Europe must... Uh, get its act together. 
uh, that uh, they uh, met in July and took a number of decisions as to, uh, for example, the role of EFSF. And it is absolutely essential that uh, they do what's needed so that this is operational very soon. Uh, it is indeed a, a major source of worry. So you can see us as indeed uh, issuing a call to arms. We do apologize for the lack of audio on that cassette. Now, Greece's finance minister, Evangelos Venizelos, says his country will have to take more austerity measures. He was speaking this morning ahead of a cabinet meeting. The cabinet is discussing more public sector layoffs and tax rises to secure the EU IMF aid instalment Greece needs to avoid bankruptcy. Venizelos says the country needs the help of its international lenders who have imposed a string of unpopular tax rises, pension cuts and economic reforms since they rescued Greece in May 2010. He says the EU IMF and ECB's control has helped Greece from derailing fiscally. Two Italian consumer groups plan to seek damages from ratings agency Standard & Poor's after it cut Italy's sovereign debt rating. They are accusing both SMP and rival ratings agency Moody's of wanting to sink the euro and cause the financial collapse of the European Union. S&P has also been criticised by Italian politicians. But it says its ratings decision was based on independent analysis of Italy's economic and fiscal prospects and was not politically motivated. Italy is again under the spotlight in Europe's debt crisis. Its creditworthiness is now below Slovakia's and on a par with Malta's. The downgrade came not in as a big surprise, but it's getting more and more ugly because the outlook is negative. That means that we will have further downgrades. It's a pity because Italy would be able to cut even more expenses and do a next industrial revolution, but politics are very weak right now in Italy. Italy is 1.9 trillion euros in debt. Last week, the government passed an almost 60 billion euro austerity plan. But it seems it wasn't enough to prevent Italy's growth outlook from worsening. S&P is also concerned about the ability of the government to deal with the crisis, a sentiment echoed on the streets of Rome. These politicians, this joke of Berlusconi, we've had enough. Everyone should get sacked. All the Italian politicians need to go home. I'm a grandmother and we should be helping the youngsters because if we don't, Italy will be finished. Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi is battling a widening prostitution scandal and fraud allegations. The downgrade increases pressure on European banks with French lenders among the most exposed. They hold 410 billion euros of Italian debt. Europe's top human rights court has ruled that Russia had not misused legal proceedings to destroy Yukos, which was once the biggest uh, company or the country's oil company. But former managers of the defunct firm say they have been vindicated by other parts of the ruling by the European Court of Human Rights. Russia violated the rights of the now defunct oil firm Yukos, a top court has declared. The European Court of Human Rights ruled Moscow had unfairly forced UCOS into bankruptcy in 2006 and jailed a number of its top executives. Russia claimed UCOS owed $33 billion in back tax charges, which led to the breakup of the company and its eventual takeover by the state. The firm's former directors say Moscow's actions were politically motivated, driven by the then-President Vladimir Putin's quest for power at their expense. Former CEO of Yukos Oil, Stephen Thied, gave his reaction to the ruling. It wasn't the tax that caused the company to, to fail. It was the, prevent, the, the inability of Yukos to pay those tax because of the because of the freezes on all our assets. And, uh, and, and as a result, we, we are very, very pleased with, with the rulings that have come out today. The court found Moscow had violated the rights of UCOS and didn't give it enough time to prepare a case. Piers Gardner was in court representing UCOS. The enforcement breached UCOS's rights precisely because the authorities failed to give regard to the implications for UCOS and UCOS's survival. 
Mikhail Khodorkovsky was Russia's richest man at the time and boss of Yukos. He was arrested in 2003 and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Speaking from jail on Monday, Khodorkovsky told Reuters if Vladimir Putin remains in power, hopes for reform will be extinguished and Russia's brightest people will emigrate in droves. Moscow has denied charges of wrongdoing, but former Yukos executives want $100 billion in compensation, which they want given to former shareholders. The court didn't rule on their demands, but agreed the jailing of former management, including Kordakovsky, was wrong. Kenya has reenacted price control laws after 21 years. This is the cost of living threatens to cause civil unrest in East Africa's biggest economy. But not everyone is happy. A day in a Kenyan supermarket, tough choices. Sometimes just doing without some of the commodities. Sugar is a very big necessity, but as of now, prices have shot up. And it's really a big challenge, and it happens that at times we, I do not buy it. The cost of living in Kenya has gone up by 16%. More than 56% of the country's population lives below the poverty line. Trying to fight it, Kenya's president, Mwai Kibaki, signed into law a bill that allows the return to price controls of any essential commodity. Consumer protection agencies, manufacturers and the private sector are up in arms. Government cannot control prices of products they don't produce. What will simply happen is that the producers and the marketers will simply hold the products, cause an artificial shortage and, in, and therefore make those products available on the black market at a higher cost. So the very person they're trying to safeguard is the very, very person who will suffer in this process. Inflation for the month of August stood at 16% in Kenya. With the cost of living increasing by the day, Kenyans are hoping the new laws on price controls will ease their burden at the till. It will help us, like hunger, sugar. I think that are the basics for the, the life. The fuel price is already regulated, but this hasn't eased the pain at the pumps. The Consumer Federation of Kenya says it will take more than price controls to keep inflation in check. Government should make it possible for business to be efficient. Easier for you to come in this country, open a business and run it. Kenya is however not alone. In neighboring Uganda, high food and fuel prices led to a month of violent protests. Sarah Kimani, SABC Business News, Kenya. Still with high food prices, Sudanese consumers are boycotting meat in protest against food inflation. This is the country's economic outlook continues to worsen following the split from the south in July. Now, pressures on Sudanese households are mounting and many are taking their anger to the streets. Meat prices rose more than 41% in August compared to the same time last year. That's according to Sudan's Central Bureau of Statistics. Sudan's government has blamed the soaring inflation on hoarders, but critics say it's because of state mismanagement. Overall, inflation hit 21.1% last month. The cost of cooking oil jumped 47.7% from a year earlier. Now, uh, let's take a look at what's been happening on the main African markets. Your weather details and a roundup of the local market when we come back. Stay with us. Black business will be a part of business unity South Africa only if its grievances are resolved. Well, that's the word from the newly formed Black Business Council. The council steering committee chairman, Patris Mutsebe, says the future of BUSA and the future participation of black business in BUSA is dependent on the degree to which legitimate grievances and complaints are addressed. He says he has confidence in the capabilities of the Black Business Council. One of our obligations is to make sure that, uh, that we showcase, build uh, appropriate leadership within black business that will take over and lead us. It's, it's 
It's very crucial. Uh, I have absolute confidence and, um, and I will be led by the people around here and, uh, and I've got total belief that they will take us forward and, and they will do an even better job. Now asked if divisions within the business community would not jeopardize foreign direct investment into the country, committee member Danisa Beloy said there are still transformation issues that needed to be resolved. A foreign investor who doesn't see economic development as an economic imperative, I don't believe is a clear business person. We need to look at the development of, of people, skilling people, making sure that we bring the majority of this country into the mainstream of, of, of the economy. All right, let's uh, catch up with uh, what's been happening in the markets now. Uh, an update from Gunter Deutsch. Thank you, Devin. Um, news just in is SAB Miller has upped its bid for Foster's to 10.2 billion US dollars. Uh, it seems like Foster's is going to accept it this time. One thing is for sure, it's going to uh, put a bit of pressure on SAB Miller's share price in the short term as uh, it's going to result and a great deal of cash flowing out of the company, for the moment at least. Let's see where the indices are before we say goodbye. All share index is higher by 0.4%. Industrials are down 0.2%. And financials are up 0.6%. 0.6% uh, is also the gain for resources. Gold miners are now higher by 2% on the day. Platinum miners up 1.6%. The rand's at 7.85 to the dollar, 12.29 to the pound, and 10.73 against the euro. Uh, European markets remain under pressure. The FTSE down 0.7%, the CAC 1.2%, and the DAX has lost 1.4%. Meanwhile, U.S. futures are also in the red. Uh, there is an expectation that the U.S. Federal Reserve is going to provide some stimulus tonight, but uh, that's just a hope. Actually, uh, in the meantime, it looks like traders are uh, preferring to stay grounded. Hence, U.S. futures are in negative territory. That's it for me for today. The weather is next with Christina. Thank you, Gunter, and a very good afternoon to you. Let's take a look at today's weather. We're expecting isolated drizzle along the southern coastline and stretching up toward the KwaZulu-Natal region, becoming scattered along that coastal region. Partly cloudy skies all the way northwards, but for the central interior, clear skies are expected all the way through to that western coastline. Rough seas all the way along that southern coastline from Table Bay to Port Alfred. So take a look at your temperatures this afternoon. Cape Town up to a cool 18 behind the cold front that's moving through Cape Town. 18, as I said, 18. Also for Sutherland, Uppington, 24 degrees. Johannesburg, 25. Slightly warmer in the northern parts. Musina, 33 degrees. Reaching into the high 30s for Botswana with Durban, 21 degrees. East London, cold on 19 degrees. Grahams Grahamstown, 18. Port Elizabeth, 17 degrees. And Bloemfontein, 18. Taking a look at tomorrow, clear skies for the western interior, becoming isolated showers through the Gauteng region as well as through parts of Kuzulunatal and drizzle along that eastern escarpment. But that's all from me. I hope you have a great day. Ciao. And that's a wrap for the news at one. Thanks indeed for watching. Remember, if you'd like to contact us, you could drop us an email at tvbusiness at sabc.co.za. You can also follow us on Twitter at sabcnews at one. Bye for now.